Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. The Metropolitan Opera, a centerpiece of New York cultural life, has weathered a parade of challenges throughout its 140-year history. The opera's modern success in overcoming financial constraints, temperamental reigning divas, stormy union negotiations, a two-year shutdown because of COVID, and recently, a devastating cyber attack which crippled its box office for nine days, is largely due to Peter Gelb, for almost two decades its resilient and innovative general manager. The Metropolitan Opera always seems to bounce back, and we are pleased to have Peter Gelb back with us to tell us exactly how he does it. Peter, welcome. Thank you, thank you Jim. I, I'd like to think I'm not responsible for all of those calamities, but... I, uh, I think I said largely responsible. <laughs> the, uh, but I have, this is now my uh, 17th season as general manager of the Met, so uh, I've weathered a lot of storms. A lot of storms, and I congratulate you on that. Uh, you're a New York treasure. Now, uh, one of the uh, interesting things that's arisen recently at the opera is uh, your uh, convincing advocacy of uh, Ukraine in its conflict with Russia. And uh, one would think of the opera as kind of apolitical, neutral in, uh, in world events, uh, maybe a, a bright star uh, in the night, but uh, what accounts for uh, uh, your support of Ukraine and uh, how it evolved? Well, certainly, you know, theatrically, we're not neutral in the sense that I engage directors to uh, and, and commission operas um, that can be about subjects that are that are political or, or, or potentially controversial uh, to one party or another. Um, but uh, my position as the head of the Met has been to mostly steer a clear, neutral course politically, um, uh, since the Met relies upon funding from both sides of the aisle, at least in terms of our donor population. And uh, I was advised early on in my career that I should uh, try to avoid politics, uh, at least when I'm speaking about the situations, as, as much as possible. However, in the case of Ukraine, um, uh, it's a very different situation. I mean, here we are at war with, with Russia, maybe having not directly declared war, but uh, in, from all practical purposes, we are at war. And, uh, the opera uh, being, you know, the art form of opera and the Met being at the center of that art form is a very international activity. I mean, and Russia has long played a key role uh, in the world of opera, particularly since the Iron Curtain came down. Uh, many of the greatest singers populating our stages uh, here and around the world are from Eastern Europe and from Russia. Um, the um, uh, And in fact, the Met has collaborated uh, with uh, Russian cultural institutions like the Bolshoi and the Bravinsky on co-productions. Under my watch over the past 17 years, uh, in, in recent years, I had developed a close working relationship with the Bolshoi, in fact. I didn't see any way the Met could possibly be neutral uh, in a situation where uh, Putin, you know, declared this horrible uh, war of, of, of oppression and invaded uh, Ukraine. and. Um, uh, I think that for cultural leaders and for just as political leaders, uh, uh, we have to take a position. You know, we can't allow the world to be destroyed by this monster. And, uh, and opera and culture is, a, is, is a, maybe not the center of the war, but it's certainly a part of the war. Well, that was your uh, conviction and your moral conviction, but uh, how did you go about uh, implementing it? Well, the way I went about implementing it, you know, we're getting close now to the one-year anniversary of the invasion on February 24th. I was actually in Moscow uh, two days before the invasion uh, to attend the final dress rehearsal of what was supposed to be a co-production of Wagner's opera Lohengrin that actually is opening at the Met in February. While I was there, there was a lot of talk about the potential uh, um, of the invasion. Um, but it wasn't until I got off the plane flying back to New York the day later, um, arriving on the 24th, that the invasion had begun. And I immediately uh, just reversed everything we were doing with Russia. I, I uh, not everything, but uh, 
everything that had to do with Russia uh, subsidies, uh, government, subs government subsidized institutions, um, uh, and any artists who had close personal ideological ties to Putin. So uh, we just stopped uh, doing business with Russia on, 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 in terms of those uh, uh, aspects of, of our relationships. I mean, the, the work with the Bolshoi uh, stopped. Um, we had to go and often build our own scenery and costumes instead of having them shipped from Russia. Not, had, had we wanted to have them shipped, uh, they wouldn't have been allowed to be shipped mm -hmm. anyway because of the sanctions that mm. were, were, would soon take place. Um, but um, long before any sanctions were, were announced, we created our own sanctions. We said we would not do business with, with the Bolshoi. We would not do business uh, with Putin. And at the same time, not only we didn't stop there, we also actively went to, to uh, war, I mean, culturally, uh, against Russia on the side of Ukraine by, by supporting Ukrainian artists and making our, uh, within a couple of days of the invasion, um, we were playing the Ukraine national anthem as soon as our season reopened. We had been on a, on a, a hiatus of, uh, and, and as soon as it reopened, we, the very first production that was, that, that played, I think it was on February 26th or 7th, uh, we played the Ukrainian national anthem. Within a few weeks, we had organized a big uh, concert event at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, in support of Ukraine with Ukrainian artists and featuring Ukrainian music. Um, and uh, we were fundamental, played a fundamental role in, in establishing the Ukrainian Freedom Orchestra, made up of the leading Ukrainian uh, instrumental performers in, from different opera houses and symphony orchestras in Ukraine who couldn't play, of course, in the early part, parts of the war, still are very challenged you know, when half the concerts end up not taking place because of bombings these days. Um, but uh, over the summer, last summer, we, we formed, with the help of the Polish National Opera and the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture, the Ukrainian Freedom Orchestra, which was made up primarily of musicians from Ukraine, as well as Ukrainian refugees who had left the country and some Ukrainian musicians who were, had left uh, earlier to become parts of European ensembles. And this orchestra, uh, led by my wife, Carolyn Wilson, the conductor, uh, who is of Ukrainian descent, um, toured uh, triumphantly across Europe, playing in many of the top music festivals from the London Proms to uh, Berlin to Munich to Edinburgh to ultimately uh, concerts in New York and, and the Kennedy Center and brought, brought a lot of uh, attention uh, uh, to the Ukrainian plight. And because we all know that, uh, you know, Putin and the whole history of Russia, I've worked with Russia over many, many decades uh, on cultural projects, you know, Russia, views culture, its culture, and its cultural performers as uh, part of uh, messaging the importance of, of Russian life to the world. Uh, they, they, culture is a very strong propaganda tool. And Putin was very purposefully uh, not only planning to crush Ukraine, but to crush Ukrainian culture. And so by creating this orchestra, we were showing Putin that Ukrainian culture was not so easily crushed, and that it would, it would, it would flourish uh, in spite of in spite of his efforts. Well, one of the most highly publicized things you did to implement uh, your conviction uh, was you fired Anna Netrebko. Now, Anna Netrebko was probably the premier uh, soprano who sang at the Met over the past several years. She was a star and no question about it. Uh, but she's also very close to Putin. Uh, she said uh, that uh, she wanted to sleep with Putin, um, said that publicly, uh, and uh, refused to renounce Putin, even though she was born in Russia, but she became an Austrian citizen. And uh, you uh, fired her. Um, and um, now, uh, how has that played out? And uh, how did you come to that decision, and uh, what has been uh, the aftermath? Well, you know, I, mean, I shouldn't actually say she wanted to sleep with Putin. Uh, she she's, said it would be fun. She said <laughs> that she hadn't slept with him, but but she wouldn't mind if she had. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, you know, she she there's no question she was uh, had been uh, the greatest star in opera 
um, at the Met. In fact, early on in her career, when I first started in 2006, I made a point of reaching out to her. I remember meeting her in, in Austria and making a deal with her to whereby she would be singing, she would become the leading uh, prima donna at the Met, that we would give her multiple productions every year to sing, uh, that she would be featured in our movie theater transmissions, uh, which are kind of a, a great artistic status symbol at the Met to be starring in, the, in, the, in, our, in our programs that are transmitted live to cinemas around the world. Uh, in fact, she performed and was featured in more of those cinema transmissions than any other uh, Met artist. Uh, but, you know, clearly uh, because she was unwilling to uh, separate herself from Putin, um, and we don't, we're not asking artists, Russian artists, who appear at the Met to sign, you know, declarations against Putin or anything. It's just his, her, her association with him was so obvious and, and it was so apparent, uh, it, it seemed to me to be so apparent, um, that, uh, and based upon, you know, various actions she had taken, um, that uh, she needed, in my opinion, to separate herself from him in order to uh, convince the Met and the public who goes to the Met uh, that uh, she was not uh, in favor of the war against Ukraine. And uh, she, her unwillingness to do so uh, left us with no choice but to uh, sever our relationship with her. You know, interestingly, just this week, uh, President Zelensky uh, sanctioned uh, about 100 or 200 uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, citizens, and she was on the list uh, of people who have been sanctioned by Ukraine uh, for their uh, anti-Ukrainian activities. Uh, and but there were other Russian artists as well who uh, you broke relations with. You broke relations with the Mariinsky. Well, the Mariinsky actually we hadn't really had, we at the time of the invasion we no longer had a relationship with Mariinsky. Uh, you know. Uh, so you broke relations retroactively. Well, we didn't need to break them because <laughs> uh, Valery Gergiev, the, the leader of the Marinsky uh, Opera House, um, and who, has, who far more than Netrebko has been really a, uh, almost like a cultural minister to, uh, to uh, Putin. He, you know, he has led victory concerts in, uh, in, in Georgia and uh, in Chechnya and, and in the Crimea. Um, uh, he is, um, you know, clearly is aligned with Putin in his belief that Ukraine belongs, belongs to Russia. He said it on numerous occasions uh, uh, to people I know very well and, and, and to me. So um, uh, as an artist, uh, quite frankly, we had, we had stopped working with him, uh, not because of his political beliefs, but because of his uh, art, artistically, he seemed much more kind of interested in just working on projects in Russia, and and we had we came to the conclusion that we he wasn't really right for the Met as a conductor before the invasion. Um, what, what about other um, uh, opera houses? I mean, Covent Garden comes to mind. Uh, the uh, uh, opera company in Germany and Bavaria. And, uh, Zurich, uh, did they sever relations with Russian artists as well? Well, yeah, first of all, I should, I should say that we have not severed relations with Russian artists. Um, we believe very strongly in Russian artists and Russian art. Um, and I know this, in Ukraine, you know, they really, because they're fighting a war for their survival, they've taken a very black and white opinion, viewpoint that you know, for, for them, anything Russian is unacceptable until the war is won. Um, we have a somewhat more, uh, significantly more nuanced viewpoint. I mean, I, I cannot blame Tchaikovsky for Putin's sins. Um, and well, Putin wasn't alive when Tchaikovsky was around. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, at the, in fact, last March, on the, on the very day that uh, Putin was denouncing the West for um, in one of his typical uh, uh, untrue, untrue statements, uh, he was denouncing the West for, for canceling Russian culture. Uh, we were opening a run of Eugene Onegin that very evening uh, with several major Russian artists performing leading roles, including uh, Golovatenko, the uh, Russian baritone who was singing the title role of, of Onegin. So, you know, we, on the one hand, we do not believe in, in uh, 
uh, at the Met, uh, we, do, we, we believe in Russian culture, we believe in great Russian art, and we believe in the innocent Russian artists. I mean, I think it's, they all have to make choices about whether they want to stay in Russia or not stay in Russia. Some of them can't make those choices. Some of them you know, have to stay in Russia. They have to, they have to live, uh, and they have families there. And we're not, but we're not trying to hold them hostage uh, to, their, to, to their personal beliefs. We, we want them to be able to perform um, at the Met. So is it fair to say the policy is no can cancellation but selective severance? Well, I think the policy is, uh, as I said in an interview back in the spring, is that we want to cancel Putin, not Pushkin. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that we, you know, we do not believe in making uh, Russian artists or great Russian art suffer or, or, or being uh, canceled because, because of Putin being a monster. The, as far as the other opera companies in the world are concerned, many of them uh, initially fired Natrepko. Many of them now have invited Natrepko back. Covent Garden uh, has not. Um, uh, I believe Covent Garden is on the same, has held the line as we have. Well, uh, in the course of your implementing uh, the policy, you sustained this devastating uh, cyber attack. Uh, did it cross your mind that uh, the Russians may have been seeking vengeance for uh, your severing ties with certain Russian artists? The thought crossed my mind fleetingly, but I, but I realized that uh, if Putin was spending his time seeking revenge on opera companies, it was no wonder that he was losing the war. What we've been told by uh, law enforcement officials and uh, uh, computer experts who, who deal with cyber attacks is that this is most likely the work of uh, several, there are several criminal organizations uh, working out of Europe that prey on companies in America and Europe and it's happening all the time. And we just, it just happens that we're an opera company and one that, one that uh, is anti-Russian. Well, uh, one cyber expert quoted the New York Times said that uh, the culprits, uh, that all the characteristics of uh, a cyber attack coming out of uh, Russia or Eastern Europe uh, doesn't mean it was state sponsored, doesn't mean that Putin uh, sponsored it, but certainly the cyber attack wouldn't have made Putin unhappy. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because the, um, the motivation behind most of these cyber attacks is monetary. And although the, the FBI is, is very careful about uh, making it clear that it's, it's illegal to negotiate uh, or, or, or enter, 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 enter into any sort of business uh, transaction with a cyber attack uh, uh, ransomware situation. So you never paid ransom? We have not paid ransom. And um, what was the effect of the attack? Your box office was down for how long? Our box office was down for eight or nine days, uh, which was uh, certainly during the height of the holiday uh, uh, ticket selling season. So that was uh, not, a, not a good thing by any <laughs> means. So although we did manage still uh, to sell out our run of, uh, our family run of uh, uh, English, the English Magic Flute, um, and uh, our other performances in December uh, fared fairly well in spite of the fact that we had no box office. Uh, the box office came back online and uh, ticket sales were brisk after that. Um, but we're still, um, you know, it's, it takes weeks and weeks to get all of your systems back up and running after a cyber attack. So how does an opera company function with uh, its box office down? I mean, suppose I went up to the window and said, uh, I'd like a ticket in the orchestra. What do I get? A piece of paper that says orchestra ticket? Well, what we did Tim was we, create, we created a workaround, <laughs> which was for those days when we couldn't sell tickets. Um, we created a special general admission pass for $50 so, which was a great bargain for those people who ended up uh, getting to sit in the orchestra for seats that normally would cost hundreds of dollars. Um, and this general admission pass, uh, which we made available, was, was uh, uh, we, we had this rather crude workaround, which was that we would seat everyone who had tickets that were bought before the cyber attack. And then the people with the general admission tickets would be online waiting to fill the empty seats that, that were available. So that's how we got by for those eight days. Well, uh, it's marvelous you did. Uh, 
There are reports that you have, because of COVID and because of uh, the cyber attack and uh, because of uh, uh, the economy generally, uh, that uh, admissions have uh, fallen off and you recently had to dip into your endowment, the extent of 10% of the endowment in order to keep going. Uh, do you expect to replenish the amount that you took from the endowment and uh, how is that going to work out? Well, you know, when the pandemic began in, in the spring of 2020, uh, we knew that we were going to be financially squeezed. And, you know, opera, as we know, is not exactly a, a good business model to begin with. Where we've, Even before the pandemic, we had to raise about half of our annual $300 million operating budget in the form of donations. And the rest came from earned revenue at the box office and our movie theater uh, transmissions. Um, so when the pandemic began, we first of all, we were shut down for a year and a half and uh, we had no revenues, but of course our expenses were much lower as well. Uh, when we came back... Well, uh, you did have some revenues because you could subscribe uh, uh, with a credit card to uh, uh, one of your uh, virtual productions. True, I mean, we, well, but it was very minimal compared. That, it, was in, it was a very minimal... Not, not several hundred dollars a, 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 a minimal A minimal revenue stream. Uh, but we certainly kept the interests of opera lovers alive by offering free streams to our operas from our vast library. And we have uh, Met Opera on Demand, which is the service I think you're referring to, yeah. which you can subscribe to, of which we have about 35,000 subscribers. But it was you know, a drop in the bucket compared to what our box office and movie theater uh, revenue typically is. Uh, we also you know, saved money, but, and that was why we had to furlough many of our union members. Uh, we paid their medical benefits, but we had to furlough them. Uh, when we came back, suddenly our expenses were, were back up to normal, but our revenue was not. So we, had, um, a, uh, we knew this was going to be a problem, and we raised more money from donations than we ever have before in history. But the trouble was that we, the, the, although we ended the year, our fiscal year ends uh, at the end of July, we ended the year with a balanced budget on paper, we were short on cash because with all the donations that came in, many of them uh, had cash earmarked for later years. And because of, also because of the stock market instability and decline, uh, our very generous donors were more cautious about shelling out cash to us um, when we needed it. Uh, they, okay, were, they so made commitments, but, but without the cash. So we're rapidly running out of time, but I, th I thought you should certainly talk about your new productions because that was one of the solutions to uh, the problem. Right, well, I think you know, the, the, the path forward for opera is, a, is an ancient art form. And uh, the path forward for opera is renewal, artistic renewal. And we have found remarkably in the last couple of seasons that the new works that we are commissioning, new works that are accessible and appealing to audiences who can relate to, to the stories in terms of their own lives. Uh, operas like The Hours that just had a very successful run, the adaptation of the Michael Cunningham novel and f later film, uh, uh, Terence Blanchard's Fire Shut Up My Bones, his upcoming opera Champion, uh, new productions of Dead Man Walking, uh, the Malcolm X opera X, the Spanish language opera of Florencia and El Amazonas. These are all operas that are um, selling actually today better than the traditional classics because our core- Aida, Boheme, Traviata. Well, I mean, there's, al there's always room for these great operas. They're timeless, they're, they're works of genius. But the difference for the Met going forward is gonna be a ratio of, of new work to older classics that's greater than ever before. So we will be presenting more new works than ever before in the history of the Met in the coming seasons. Uh, next season, in fact, we have six contemporary operas, four of which are getting the Met premieres, two of which are, are coming back. The Hours with its same cast of Rene Fleming, Joyce DiDonato, and Kelly O'Hara, uh, and Fire Shut Up My Bones. So that, repre your, that represents almost a third of our, of our season. We'll what are you going to open with next season? Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking. A new production by Ivo Van Hova, starring Joyce DiDonato. That's about capital punishment. It is about capital punishment. So I have a question for you, Peter Gelb. In closing, what is your prognosis for the Metropolitan Opera? My prognosis is cautious optimism. I believe that, uh, of course, you never know with the health crisis and world events, but I think that we're on the right artistic course, that we have uh, uh, found 
a, a way forward that will bring new, diverse, younger audiences to the Met. We've proven we can do that. Um, and I think opera has a real future because of that. That's the future of the opera, world events and uh, circumventing health crises. <laughs> and, and artistically having a winning, a winning formula. Yeah. You are cutting back on uh, productions generally, aren't you? No, we're cutting, we're cutting back on, on revivals of operas that don't sell. Uh, we're adding operas that do sell. And, uh, and by selling, I mean ones that are, that are going to capture the imagination of a broader public. We can no longer rely upon the, old, the older core opera audience. They have dwindled through age and attrition. Um, the av and in fact, the very, one very encouraging sign of the opera is that the average age of an opera attendee this year at the Met is 52 years old. That's down from 60s uh, when I first got there. Younger next year. Every year. Every year. So, Peter Gelb, thank you so much for coming by. This has been just marvelous. Thank you so and much. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, and all the best.